Folks, um, it's lovely to have another opportunity to share with you. If you're new to St John's and you don't know me, I attend the 10 o'clock service and I'm normally like one of you. Um, and I'm usually sitting in the congregation. But um, as a member of the preaching team, occasionally they let me loose on you and tonight's one of those occasions. Now let's face it, <clears throat> the book of Ezekiel is not a book of the Bible that we read all that often. It's easy to read it and then a few years later you forget it and then suddenly someone like Kerry reads you a passage of scripture that, uh, and you listen to that and if you're like me, you wonder what on earth this prophet lying down for 390 days and cooking his bread over a flaming wad of human excrement and you start to wonder what is this chapter doing in the Bible? Um, well, believe it or not, for all of its wild content, um, it has some very relevant messages for today and hopefully, as we study it over the next few minutes, um, the Lord will reveal those to us. So let us pray and then we'll get into the book. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to read your word. We pray that you will give us a message that speaks to our heart and above all things, Lord, help us to shine our light into the world and to show the love of Christ to others. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, um, the um, last week Glenn told you about the Lord um, summoning Ezekiel to behave like a watchman and warn the people of Israel. This week, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of the message that he had to spread. Although the Israelites wouldn't so much hear his message, they will see it. Now, this is a picture of Tim, not our Tim. This is another artist called Tim. And Tim goes around the world sitting on plinths like this with his tattooed back. And uh, in this occasion, he was photographed in the Mona Art Gallery at Tasmania, which if you've been to it, it's famous for some pretty weird art. Um, anyway, Tim and his tattooed dorsal region are an ongoing artwork, I'm told. The work was sold unfinished to a German art collector in 2008 for more than $250,000, which says nothing for his taste, does it? Imagine putting that in your lounge room. Um, believe it or not, this artwork isn't even finished. The work will only be considered finished when Tim dies and the tattoo is handed over to its owner. Friends, this is what the art world calls performance art. We've been thinking, you usually think of art as being drawings and painting on canvas, but the art world has extended art to mean things like videos and even live performances. For example, I'm aware of an artwork, I think it's in the Tate Gallery, it's a nice little lounge room and in the middle of the lounge room is a telephone. It's an artwork by Yoko Ono and every now and then apparently she rings the telephone and one of the people visiting the gallery picks it up and is able to speak to Yoko Ono. That's a rather interesting idea of art. I remember on another occasion my son who is a video artist, um, he was involved in the Sydney Biennale which is, I think, a, a, an art exhibition that occurs every couple of years. And he was out on Cockatoo Island and his job was to paint a wall every 20 minutes. And every 20 minutes, he and a mate painted it white. And after the next 20 minutes, they painted the same wall black. And apparently that was really exciting, watching the wall change. Um, this is performance art. It's usually quite provocative. And it's thought to be something which is developed in the postmodern 20th century and 21st century period. Well, it's not really new because God told Ezekiel in 585 BC of, to perform an artwork to warn the Israeli tribes who were living under the threat of further invasion and terror by the Babylonians, that if they didn't mend their ways, they would face very severe judgment. The Israelites had already proven that they were not going to listen to what God had to say if they were just told. So it would appear that this time God decides to give them a visual demonstration of what's about to befall them if they don't mend their ways. Now, reading from verse 1, which Kerry read, let's just go through it and pull this uh, chapter apart. Now, son of man, take a block of clay, obvious enough, put it in front of you and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set camps against it and put battering rams around it. So what Ezekiel is doing 
is a sort of a half millennium BC version of using Lego, except he's using a block of clay. And he builds a model and he's got it there for people to look at. Then God goes on. He says, take an iron pan, which is something the Israelis would have used to build fire in and cook things in, place it as an iron wall between you and the city and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. Now, Ezekiel himself was one of the exiles of Israel who was living by the Kabar River, which is near the Euphrates. In other words, he was living in Babylon, which was the invading country of Israel. Many Jews were, in fact, taken from their country and moved around the world as as a result of an earlier invasion by the Babylonians. Had been allowed to keep their temple and the great city of Jerusalem all intact um, with its fine buildings. But their king was replaced uh, with a relative who was expected to be more compliant than the other ba- to the Babylonians. But according to Ezekiel, things are about to get much worse. He starts speaking to the people of Israel about five years before the whole great city of uh, Jerusalem, which had stood for nearly a thousand years and established by King David and built to its zenith under the reign of King Solomon, was going to be completely destroyed. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was about to lay siege to Jerusalem in only two years after um, Ezekiel did this performance. And after a three-year siege, and while he was doing that, um, the three-year siege meant that nobody in Jerusalem could eat and many of them starved to death. And in fact, the Book of Lamentations and the Book of Kings describes this siege and they had no food for their children and they said even the animals had no food to drink and their tongues stuck to the top of their mouths. And then after this three-year siege, the troops that Nebuchadnezzar had assembled gathered, then marched towards the city and pulled it apart brick by brick and burnt it to the ground including the great temple that Solomon had built and we no longer have it today and they took away all its priceless gold uh, contents. The people of Israel before this were living in denial. While they had experienced military defeats and at this time they were even living under Babylonian control, foreign control, they believed that the great city of Jerusalem and its temple were invincible. It was impregnable. Nobody would destroy that because that's where they understood that God would live and they didn't believe that God would ever allow it to be taken. However, God is sending them a message through Ezekiel that the, to these hard-hearted Jewish exiles that the very thing they think can't happen is about to occur. And he tells that through this model that he asks Ezekiel to build. Ezekiel's acting like something like a sculptor. As people walk by, they would stop and they would look And they would probably ask Ezekiel questions. You know, Ezekiel, this might be art, but what does it mean? And Ezekiel would tell them that the frying pan represented the furnace of God's wrath that was soon to be turned towards Jerusalem. And then God goes on to describe it further. Lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. Now, if you're called to a prophet, to be a prophet, sometimes you're asked to do some pretty hard things. And this must have been very, very difficult for Uh, Ezekiel because I'll read on he says you're to bear the sin for the number of days you lie on your side I've assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin so for 390 days you will bear the sin of the people of Israel now I don't know whether you know this or not but Israel was once one country and then it split into two and the northern uh, the, the northern 10 tribes formed a country called Israel Um, And for 390 years, they rebelled in this state against God until the country was eventually defeated and all of the 10 tribes were disappeared and uh, vanished um, into the other populations of the world. To represent their sin, Ezekiel had to lie on his side for 390 days. Now, that's a very long time to be lying on your side. It's more than a year. He didn't lie there, I don't think, for 24-7 because God tells him to do other things and Um, We all know that he would have had to do some things like eat and do other things. So he would have got up. But for quite a part of the day, he would have been doing this performance of lying on his side, tied up so he couldn't roll over. Now, if you're an Israelite in exile and you see the prophet lying down on his side for about a year, this is going to make people talk and it's going to have some impact. 
But that's not all God gets Ezekiel to do. He says, after you finish this, lie down again on your right side and bear the sin of the people of Judah, the other kingdom. I have assigned you 40 days, one for each year. So Ezekiel keeps this going for another 40 days. And then he says, turn your face towards the siege of Jerusalem and with bared arm uh, prophesy against her. So while he's doing all this, he's talking at the same time. I will tie you up with ropes so you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. The people walking past would have said, what's this meant to symbolise? And they would have realised he's there for an awful long time. And some might even have been moved to think, we have sinned against the Lord very deeply for a very long time. No doubt they'd have asked Ezekiel questions and he might have even answered what it all meant. Now we come to the really bizarre part. God tells Ezekiel how he's to feed himself during this period of time. I'm sure you remember this. He said, take wheat and barley and beans and lentil and millet and spelt, which is not exactly um, a varied diet, but uh, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You're to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Also measure out a sixth of a hin of water. And my small group actually hit their, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Bible dictionaries and they found out that a hin of water is about six litres. So he's asked to drink a litre of water. I'm pretty sure he would have got up sometime during that time. Um, anyway, so he drank a litre of water at set times Eat the food you would, uh, as you would a loaf of barley bread, bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. Now, why is he doing something as repulsive as this? Um, firstly, Ezekiel is actually warning the people of Israel that when they fall under siege in two years' time, they're going to be forced into doing some very revolting things. There's a nice poo pile burning for you so you can see what it looks like. In verse 13, the Lord said, In this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations, where I will drive them. But Ezekiel finds this a real problem for his conscience. He says, Not so, Lord. I have never defiled myself from my youth until now. I've never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No pure, impure meat has ever entered my mouth. Friends, the Jewish people were very, very particular about cleanliness. Now, I know that um, as I look around, I know some of you are, um, have young children and you get during that time, um, poo just becomes a normal part of life, doesn't it? And, uh, and I have to say, it doesn't feel unclean at all. Um, we seem to be cleaning it up. Um, I recall a picture my daughter-in-law gave me of my new grandson, Lockie. He's only eight months old. And I said, gee, he's got pumpkin soup all over himself. And she says, no, that's not pumpkin soup. And he did that to himself while he was in his little um, car seat and was like that um, for nearly an hour before she found it. So whilst, whilst it's something that not all of us find offensive, it is something that would have been very, very offensive to the Jewish people to be doing this. Um, For example, Ezekiel was a very faithful Jew, and Jews certainly don't touch fecal matter. They're pure. They wash every day before meals, and even if they've travelled any distance, they would wash even in their neighbour's place. So the Lord says to Ezekiel, he says, very well, I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. Well, there's a concession, isn't it? (laughs) But the weight of this is going to set in, he says... Son of man, I am about to cut off the food supply in Jerusalem. We can laugh at this, but this is going to get very serious for the people of uh, Jerusalem. The people will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair, and that's what it was meant to mean. They would eventually do what Ezekiel is doing while he's lying down. For food and water will be scarce, God says. They will be appalled at the sight of each other and they will waste away because of their sin. Just like Ezekiel, the people of Judah will be wasting away on limited rations. Now this is meant to be, and I think it is, a very powerful model or living illustration of what God thinks about sin and how he will certainly judge it. I suspect this is one of those sermons you will not forget for a while, um, because we've been talking so much about human excrement. Ezekiel 
is not talking in this case about a judgment to come in the afterlife. He is talking about a judgment that many of them are going to see and experience as the great city of Jerusalem is first of all besieged and then destroyed completely because of their sin and their ancestors' sin. Now, friends, it is amazing how thick-skinned we can be about and how deceptive our hearts can become about sin and judgment. Everybody loves what Jesus had to say, but few of us remember that uh, Jesus spoke a lot about the day of judgment and hell. He described hell as being a day of weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the Gospels, he speaks more about hell than any other person in the Bible. Um, We hear talk about hell and yet we carry on as if it's not going to happen, um, as if it's not real. We go to funerals and we prefer, when we're at a funeral, to just hope for the best, regardless of what we know to be the facts. Surely there's a back door and God will accept them. They're a good person, they didn't take Jesus as their Lord, but they should go to heaven because they were good. Um, I'd let them into heaven if I were God. Um, you can see how deceptive our hearts can be on this. Jesus spoke very clearly about the reality of hell and judgment, and yet to assuage our conscience, it makes us feel better sometimes to pretend that it's not real. Friends, we've got to get used to the idea that this stuff is very real. The people in exile were just the same. You really wonder how thick-skinned they could have been. They got clear messages from God before they went into exile. They told that they didn't change, they'd be in exile. They go into exile and they're still not being moved when they're getting a message to change, even though they've experienced that judgment in part during their own lives. Now, this denial of judgment is as old as sin itself. Remember back to the Garden of Eden? When the serpent tempted Eve, what did he say to her? He said, you will not die. And yet God had told them if they ate of the tree, they would die if they sinned. What the serpent was saying in plain English was that the judgment God said would come upon you, he didn't mean it. You can eat of the tree and nothing will happen because God doesn't really mean what he says. The temptation to deny the reality of justice is as old as sin itself. It persisted in Ezekiel's day and it still persists in ours. Even though we don't have a prophet lying down with a model cooking bread on a pile of dung, we have equally graphic warnings of God's judgment today happening seemingly at random all over the world. Friends, the Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans this, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed. Note, he says it is being revealed. It's right now and all the time against wickedness and godlessness of people who suppress the truth of God. How is God's wrath being revealed in our world? Well, God has handed the world over to sinful people and we can see that God's creation, made perfect, is now running amok. In chapter 13 of Luke's Gospel, we read that Jesus himself was questioned during his ministry about two disasters that happened during his life. One of them was the man-made, one was man-made and the other one was a natural disaster. The natural one was when a tower in the city called Siloam fell and crushed many people, a seemingly random act of, a random act of God. And the, other quest, and, and the question Jesus was asked, he said, were the victims of this natural disaster guiltier than everybody else who wasn't killed in this accident? Well, Pilate sent some soldiers into a temple to slaughter people and there were some Galileans who were worshipping in the temple at that time. And they were killed. And the question Jesus was asked, were they guiltier than the others who were because they were killed in this way? And Jesus didn't say that they were guilty. He turned to the people who asked them the question and said, look, unless you repent, you too will perish. This is a fate that awaits us all. No one escapes. In other words, Jesus was agreeing with Paul that the wrath of God is being revealed every time we attend a funeral. We are experiencing what the wrath of God is doing because we are destined to die. People killed in disasters aren't guiltier than the rest of us, but these events serve to remind us and should serve to remind us about God's judgment, that it's real and that there is no escape. And as a result, we need to repent and get our lives in order. And friends, if you have not made your peace with God, I would be kidding you and wrong if I did not tell you that God's judgment is very real. Um, the message that Ezekiel reminds us is also that it is appropriate to warn others 
This is, can, some, can sometimes be very uncomfortable. Um, I think about my non-Christian friends and when I'm speaking to them, I usually say, look, you should consider Jesus, he's a great option. But really, I probably ought to because it doesn't have quite the same force of telling them that, look, we are all facing judgment by God and we need to turn to Jesus or we will not escape. I'm still really trying to find a good way to explain that to people who don't necessarily share the same worldview as me, but that is the message. Of course, Jesus has come to save us from that judgment, but that judgment is very real. So having read about Ezekiel in this memorable fashion that indelibly will remain on our minds, I imagine, for at least the course of a week, what does it mean for us today in 2021? Well, first of all, I think, is, as Ezekiel found, getting God's message out can be very hard and involve great personal cost. As a result, we should not only spare a thought for people who are doing that on a full-time basis or overseas or in our community, but we really should be helping them out in whatever way we can. Um, it's a holy thing to be given the job of, by God to spread his word. We all have that in some part, but there's a special um, sacrifice made by people who do it on a particularly full-time basis and we should think of them. The second thing is God finds sin ugly. If you think eating bread baked over poo is revolting, then think of that as a visual for what our sin looks like before God, because frankly, our sin looks much worse. And it should remind us of how desperate we are and how much we need God's help to be restored. And we should have less to do with sin if you think about how ugly it looks before a perfectly holy God. And then finally, friends, the happy news of this is we are called to do some performance art ourselves. Our lives are meant to be a performance piece before the world to attract others to Christ. You're wondering how I was going to get round to the verse of the day, weren't you? Um, Jesus said in John chapter 13, he said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you so that you must also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As Christians, we are meant to display lo the love of God to each other. Look around the room, friends. These are people you have a responsibility to, in the name of Christ, to love uncontrollably and unconditionally. Sometimes, as Ezekiel found, it will involve sacrifice. It might involve effort. But the command remains, we are to love each other in this exemplary fashion. And there are many love-starved people who come to Christ because they see and experience unconditional, sacrificial love that Jesus inspired. Friends, I am one of those. When I was about 15 years old, I went to live with a Christian family and I had not been brought up a Christian. I saw the love that was in that household and I wanted a piece of it. And when they told me that it came from Jesus, I wanted to be part of it and joined and my life was changed forever as I gave my heart to Jesus. Similarly, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew's Gospel, and this is where we get to our text of the day, that they should let their light shine. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they stick it on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Friends, you'll notice that Jesus specifically mentioned deeds, not just words. Of course, words are important, but Jesus said that our deeds that we do in the community are a means of showing God's light to the world. Friends, this week, I want you to think about um, the prophet Ezekiel lying on his side for days, um, reminding people about God's judgment and cooking his dinner over a poo fueled fire and be grateful that God has not called you to do that. But you have been called to do a very different piece of performance art, to love each other and to do good deeds in the world. So we should think deeply about how we might do that and express that because if anything, that is the message that Ezekiel has for us today. It has been a great pleasure sharing that with you and I suspect that you'll at least remember the topic, if nothing else, of this sermon, so thanks. Thank <laughs> you.